Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. howdy! It's great to see you all this morning. Great to be back at FaithBridge. My name is Timothy Atik, and I'm the executive director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. And uh, I just, I love this place. And any opportunity I have to get to FaithBridge, I, uh, I always love to take it. So it's great to see you. I hope that you've had a great spring break if, you have, if you've been on break. Um, I know that when you hit the real world, spring break is not a thing anymore. <laughs> it's just life. All right, I get it. I want to start out just by telling you about an experience I had when I was a freshman at Texas A&M University. Uh, some of my close friends and I, we decided to try out for this very selective men's organization. And so I will never forget the, uh, the tryout process for this organization. My friends and I loaded up into the car and we made our way to, to a random place. And when we walked in, the different members in this organization would spread out all around the room. And then someone would basically say, go. And about 200 people trying out for 30 or 40 spots would scatter all around the room and get in line to talk to these different members. And so it was not uncommon to spend the majority of your time standing in line waiting to talk to uh, one of the members of this organization. Now, the fact that there were 200 people going out for 30 or 40 spots made every other man in the room my competition. I mean, even the guys that I rode with, it was like, guys, I love you. But when we get in that room, it's every man for himself. We'll see on the flip side. Okay, that's how it kind of went with my friends. And so just because you would spend a good amount of your nights standing in line, you couldn't help but just begin to look around at your competition. And as you looked at your competition, you couldn't help but compare yourself to your competition. So it'd be like, well, that guy's clearly a dork. I'll get him before he does. (laughs) Okay, now that guy's jacked, and I'm not, so he's probably going to get him before I do. Okay, that guy over there, he just talked to that member for 30 minutes. My conversation was over after five minutes, so that's probably not a very good sign. And then the night would end, and my friends and I, we would get back in the car, and we would just debrief about the night. Well, how'd it go for you? How many people did you get to talk to? What do you think your chances are? And then I remember going over to the student center to pick up a letter, and I actually have... The letter right here, I don't know what the psychology is behind still having the letter. Maybe you can (laughs) diagnose my problem there. But I remember going to the student center to pick up this envelope, and uh, I remember opening up the envelope, and I will spare you a lot of the, the fluff in the letter, but it basically, it says this. It says, unfortunately, the nature of this organization requires that this process be selective. At this time, we must inform you that you have not been selected. And I remember getting that letter, and right after I opened my letter and read it, I looked up and I saw one of my close friends uh, who I kind of gone through the process with opening his letter, and his reaction to his letter was different than the reaction that I had, because as he read his letter, I will never forget his face. He just closed his eyes, and he smiled because he had gotten in. And in that moment, I remember seeing that and just thinking, of course he got in. He's more likable than I am. He's more successful than I am. He was enough for them, and I wasn't. I want to spend some time this morning talking about this idea of our enoughness. Do you know what it's like to feel like you are not enough? Maybe you know exactly what it feels like for someone to hand you a letter like this. Maybe it's not from an organization in college, but maybe it feels like a parent has handed you a letter like this. I regret to inform you, you're not enough for me. Maybe you've been handed a letter like this from your spouse or your former spouse, Or maybe it's a boss or a former boss, or maybe it's a job that you wanted and you applied for, but you didn't get. Maybe it's a a group of friends, a group of people that you've wanted to engage with, but they just don't 
want you. I believe that we all are acquainted with what it feels like to not sense that we are enough for someone else. And so uh, today and next week, we're going to talk about this idea of our enoughness. And if I could put a label on these two weeks, let it be this, enough with being enough. That's the goal of these two weeks, enough with being enough. And what I want to do today and next Sunday is I want to identify two key um, factors or forces that are at play in our lives that that cause us to question our enoughness. So next week, we're going we're gonna to talk about this force of conformity, where we, have, where we believe that we have to become who someone else needs us to be in order for us to be enough for them. So next week, we'll talk about conformity. Don't miss it. This week, though, we're going to talk about comparison. I believe that we compare ourselves to others like breathing. We do it without even realizing it. Unfortunately, the overflow of comparison in our lives is insecurity, low self-esteem, low self-worth, anxiety, depression, and at times even suicide. Comparison, and this is not an exaggeration, comparison can ruin your life. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is spend a little bit of time looking at the life of King Saul. But I want you to hear me say this morning that there is absolutely a better way. There is. The goal of these next two weeks is to really fight for our joy. It's to get to a place where we can say, enough with being enough. And it's going to start this morning with us getting to a place where we can say, enough with comparison. So if you have a Bible, I want you to join me today in 1 Samuel chapter 18, because that's where we're going to pick it up with King Saul. 1 Samuel 18. And as we look at the life of of King Saul, my hope is to give you four key truths about comparison that will help you, hopefully lead you to a place where you can declare enough with comparison. 1 Samuel chapter 18, again, we're looking at the life of King Saul. What you need to know about King Saul is that he was the first ever king of the nation of Israel. And he was a mediocre king. He really was. He was a mediocre king. And so God told King Saul, he says, I'm going to replace you. He's going to replace King Saul with a better king. And we now know that that king that replaced Saul was this shepherd boy named David. But Saul has no idea when that time is coming. Where we are stepping into the story is right after David beats Goliath. And so it's this story where King Saul and his men tremble with fear at the sight of Goliath. And then this little shepherd boy comes up with his sling and a stone and he drops that giant. And then they begin to make their way back to town. And this is where we pick it up. So as I read, listen for the comparison because comparison is the match that really sets Saul's life on fire and burns it to the ground. Here we go, verse six, chapter 18. It says this, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy with musical instruments, and the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Here's the comparison. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. This is the women singing. This is them putting the comparison on Saul and David. But then Saul begins to compare himself. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Now watch his life unravel. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. 
as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Isn't it interesting that a king that has power and wealth and prestige can struggle with comparison? If a king can struggle with comparison, then I promise you, we can too. Several weeks ago, I shot up in bed at about two in the morning because our security alarm was going off in the house. And so I jumped out of bed, and as I stood there in a daze, the question that I had to answer in that moment at two o'clock in the morning was this, did someone just break into my house? That's the question that I had to answer in the fog, and the reason that I tell you that is because of what Theodore Roosevelt says about comparison. He says this, he says, comparison is the thief of joy. Do you hear that? Comparison is the thief of joy. Now, if comparison is a thief, then the question that you need to answer this morning is, has comparison broken into the house of your soul and robbed you? Has that happened? Has comparison flooded your soul without you even realizing it? I believe that the answer to that question is easy. That's why the first key truth you need to know about comparison is this. Wake up. You're getting robbed. That's it, that's the first key truth that I need you to hear. Wake up, you are getting robbed. You are. Comparison is a problem for every single person in this room. Tell me that you've never compared your home to someone else's home or your car to someone else's car. Have you ever compared jobs? Have you ever compared job titles? Have you ever compared success or accomplishments? Have you ever compared spouses or kids? Have you, what, what haven't you compared is really the question. Have you compared likability? Have you looked at someone else and seen how outgoing or social they are compared to you? Maybe it's perceived godliness. We all struggle with comparison. So if comparison is an issue for all of us, one of the best things that each of us can do is simply to determine, simply determine who, what, and when. Let me explain it this way. As I was preparing for this talk, um, I got onto Apple's website because I wanted to, to see if it would be possible for me to compare the different iPhone models. So let me just show you what I did, okay? Here's what I did. Went to Google, of course, and went to apple.com, and uh, my goal was to compare different iPhone models, so I went up to the iPhone tab, I clicked on it. Now, fortunately for me, because I wanted to compare, there was actually a tab on the right called Compare. And so I clicked on compare, and it took me to a page with the different iPhone models side by side by side. And if you scroll down through this page, what it does is it compares each iPhone model side by side by side, and it compares the different features. Here's the thought that I had as I was preparing for this talk. What if we could somehow click on a compare tab of your life? If we clicked on a compare tab of your life, what would we see? Who are you comparing your life next to? Who is on your side by side by side comparison and what features are you comparing? So just to answer that question right now, who is on your comparison chart? It's different for everyone. Who is it for you? Is it, is it a coworker? Is it, is it a particular friend? Is it one of your siblings, maybe it's someone you don't even know their name. You just see them every day at the gym and you look at them and you look at you and you begin to compare. Who do you compare yourself with? Then determine the question, answer the question what? What features are you comparing? 
Because when you answer the question, what, it will tell you what you value most. What do you tend to compare? Is it looks, like how attractive you are? Maybe you compare weight. Do you compare social standing? Do you compare how much money you have compared to someone else? Do you compare homes or cars, material possessions? Do you compare accomplishments? What do you compare? That'll tell you the who and the what, and then the third is when. Well, I'll answer that for you. We compare every single day, many of us all throughout the day. The reality is for many of us, not all of us, but for many of us, our days start by looking at social media and our days end by looking at social media. Social media is the greatest source of comparison in our lives today. So if social media marks the bookends of your day, I wouldn't be surprised if you are comparing yourself to others without even thinking about it all throughout the day. The first key reality you need to know about comparison is this, wake up, you are getting robbed. The second key reality you need to know about comparison is this, comparison feeds on er and as, okay? Now, let me unpack that for you because I don't, I would imagine no one here is like, oh yes, praise Jesus, that's good, that's good. (laughs) But follow me on this, comparison feeds on er and as. Look back at 1 Samuel 18. Let me read again verses 6 through 8. Listen to what it says. It says, As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments, and the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands, and what more can he have but the kingdom? So follow me on this. They begin to come back to town from the battle of David and Goliath, and women come out of the city to meet who? Saul, they come out singing songs to who? They come out playing tambourines for who? Men, let me ask you, when's the last time a woman played the tambourine for you? (laughs) It's probably been a long time. It's probably never. Why? Because you're not important enough for a woman to play the tambourine for you. (laughs) But Saul was. Saul had power. He had wealth. He had prestige. He was the king. He was considered great. The women came out of the town to meet Saul, and they begin singing a song, and in that song, what do they sing? They say, Saul has struck down his thousands, and so they are celebrating Saul. They're not trying to to knock Saul. They're trying to celebrate that Saul is a conquering king. But where's the problem? Saul has struck down his thousands, Thousands, David, his ten thousands. Saul begins to listen to the praise that is given to David versus the praise that is given to him, and his life begins to unravel. Why? Because he doesn't want to just be great, he wants to be greater. That's the problem. Saul wanted to be greater. Philosopher and psychologist John Dewey once said this. He said, the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to feel important. You want to know how this often gets fleshed out? I've made reference to this so many times when I've been at Faith Bridge. But the way that this deep need to feel important gets fleshed out in our lives, it's, it's something that Pastor Andy, Andy Stanley refers to as the ur factor that we long to know that we have the er factor over other people in our lives. We need to know that we are smart er, strong er, funny er, pretty er, skinny er, wealthy er, godly er, successful er than the people around us. We long to know that we have the er factor in our lives. I distinctly remember this time that I was at the gym just running on the treadmill and, and God hit me over the head. 
And I didn't hear an audible voice, but I just remember as I was running, I had this moment of clarity where I realized I need everyone else around me to be a nobody so that I can feel like a somebody. You know what I was realizing in that moment? I needed everyone else to fail so that I could feel like a success. That's the er factor at play in, in my life. Just think about that. Is the er factor at play in your life? Is there something in you that needs to know that you have the er factor over other people around you? Some of you, that's gonna resonate with you right now. Others of you, you're sitting there saying, I don't think so, I don't sense that. For you, it's not as much the er factor as it is the as factor. Because what you potentially do is you look out into the world at what you have determined in your own mind to be the ideal. And you begin to tell yourself if you could just be as smart, or as pretty, or as funny, or as outgoing, or as high high capacity, or as successful, as the ideal in this world, then, you would truly be enough. Do you see it? Comparison feeds on the er and as factor it does. Here's what I wanna do. Let me just identify a problem with the er factor and a problem with the as factor. The problem with the er factor is that no matter how many people in this world you have the er factor over, someone will always have the er factor over you. And when you realize that, it will launch you back into this perpetual cycle of needing to be enough, yet never seeming to get there. The problem with the as factor is that perfection is an illusion. Perfection is not reality. Your perception of other people is not reality. Can we all agree that Instagram is not reality? There's actually nothing instant about Instagram because we all need time to crop and filter and color correct our images. That's why people, when they post a picture that look really good, looks really good, they use the hashtag no filter. As if to say, just to be clear, the majority of my pictures, I doctor. This one, I haven't. (laughs) This is a truly instant gram. There's nothing nothing real about Instagram. But how often do we compare our unfiltered lives to other people's filtered feed? This is what we do. One pastor put it this way. He said, we compare our behind-the-scenes footage to other people's highlight reels. And man, that that is a bad game to play. Let me just illustrate it this way, just to show you that perception is not reality. Right here, I have the Atik, that's my last name, the Atik family Christmas card for 2017. Hopefully, you can, you can see that semi-well. Okay, so there's just kind of a collage of pictures of us on the front, but man, this baby opens up and bam, look at that. (laughs) I mean, just look at that perfect family. I mean, clearly, Kat and I right here, we are a smoking hot couple just rocking (laughs) our mid to late 30s. And then uh, right here, this is Andrew. He is a stud and he is just crushing kindergarten right now. (laughs) This right here, this is Noah, he's the man, dominating second grade. But then right here on the back, didn't see that coming, did you? That, that's baby Jake. And baby Jake, we're assuming, is just days away from a baby modeling contract because he has got it (laughs) going on. We're a perfect family. I mean, hopefully you can see that from our card. We are a perfect family. Now. Do you want to know what was taking place on either side of the camera (laughs) button being pushed to get these pictures? Let me just tell you what was going on. We decided to take these pictures in about 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. Do you know how hard it is to get a little kid's hair to stay put in 20 to 30 mile an hour winds? So 
right before these pictures were taken, man, I was all over my kids. Stop laying down, stop running away, get out of the woods. Stop messing with each other. Put your hands at your side. Stop tilting your head a weird way. <laughs> and then you know what happened on the back side of taking these pictures? Well, because we were taking pictures in such high winds, something flew in my two and a half month old's eye. It scratched his eye, and we took a thousand dollar trip to the ER. Here's the good news, though. The good news is right now on March 18th of 2018, we're about halfway through getting our Christmas cards out for 2017. <laughs> Perfection is an illusion. Perception is not reality. Have you ever thought that the ideal life that someone is living in your imagination is far from perfect in reality. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that the people who you believe have it all actually are left wanting more? Have you ever allowed yourself to think for just a second that those people who you consider to be the ideal are actually looking out into this world longing for the as factor, comparing their lives to other people. See, comparison feeds on er and as. The third key reality you need to know about comparison is this comparison has terrible side effects. I talked about the, the last time I was here, I was talking about money and I just talked about those drug commercials. You remember that, that, that voice that comes on at the end of the commercial? Like, talk to your doctor before using this medication where it tells you all the side effects. You know what I'm talking about? This medication can cause diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, demon possession, those sorts of things. You remember, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Because it's warning you, like, this medication can have severe side effects. I'm here to tell you that comparison has terrible side effects. It absolutely has side effects. If you were to go and look at Saul's life, comparison fueled anger in verse 8. In verse 9, comparison fueled suspicion and paranoia. In verse 12, comparison caused fear. If you were to keep reading, comparison caused um, Saul to spend the rest of his life trying to kill David, trying to thwart the plan of God. And it cost him the respect of his son, his daughter, and all of his men. And in the end, Saul committed suicide. Comparison produces terrible side effects. Let me just tell you what it will produce in your life, the first thing it'll produce is competition. See, comparison fuels competition and it starves connection. You can't be close to someone as long as you're competing with that person. It ruins relationships. It fuels pride. You'll look for people that you are better than so that you will feel better about yourself. It fuels envy. You'll wish that you were a little bit less of what God has given you and a little bit more of what he has given someone else. It'll produce anxiety because you will consistently feel like you aren't doing enough. It'll produce exhaustion because you will actually never be able to do enough. It'll prompt resentment. You will resent other people's successes because you believe that their success makes you a failure and you'll resent God for not giving you more of what others have. It'll, it'll foster an unhealthy gratification inside of you. You will inwardly celebrate people's failures because it will make you feel more like a success. It'll fuel dishonesty. You will live a lie. It's called smiling depression where you act happy and self-assured even when in reality you are sad and stressed out. If you are exhibiting any of these symptoms, please see my first point. Wake up. You are getting robbed. The last key reality you need to know about comparison is this. The cross of Christ does what comparison can't. The cross of Christ does what comparison can't. Let me just be very honest with you guys. This 
message this morning is a very, very personal message for me. I became the executive director of Breakaway almost two years ago, but it all started at a breakfast with former Breakaway director, Ben Stewart, who is a part of the Faithbridge family here. He really grew up in a lot of ways at this church. But around April 5th, in 2016, I sat down with Ben at breakfast, and Ben just said, hey, man, here's the deal. I'm leaving Breakaway. I'm going to Passion City, and I want you to be the next director of Breakaway. And you have to understand that that was a very surreal moment for me, because when I was a student at Texas A&M University, Breakaway was my favorite part of my college experience. So the thought of even getting to go back and be a part of a ministry that really helped shape the spiritual trajectory of my college career was a dream opportunity. And so we couldn't believe the opportunity that God was giving us. And it was great because there were so many people who were encouraging, so many people were excited for us in that moment, but it also awakened this socially awkward gene in so many people. Like I remember speaking at this event in Austin and I had literally just walked down off the stage after preaching my heart out. And this guy looked at me and and here's what he said. He said, hey, so you're taking over Breakaway? Man, Ben Stewart is such an incredible speaker. (laughs) And I was like, that is a true statement. (laughs) Ben's not here right now, can I take a message? I don't know what to say. How do I respond to you in this moment? And then I remember speaking at another event where this guy was like, you're taking over Breakaway? Man, you have big shoes to fill. (laughs) You can't imagine how many times someone told me, you have big shoes to fill. Another person was like, man, is it tough following Ben Stewart? (laughs) And I was like, I don't, this is so uncomfortable because Ben is one of my close friends. And I personally believe that Ben is one of, if not the best communication, communicator in our nation today. Ben is someone that I have looked up to for years, and I've learned so much from him. But these comments begin to take root in my soul. In comparison, broke into the house of my soul, and it began to rob me. And I began to feel insecurity and I felt insufficiency. And you know what else comparison did? Is it began to breed resentment in me towards Ben's success because I looked at Ben's success and it made me feel like a failure. And on top of that, I began to get onto the stage at Breakaway on Tuesday nights and felt like I was stepping up to an audition, wondering how I would uh, compare to Ben in the eyes of students. But things are different now. Things are different now. Ben and I have never been closer. He is one of the greatest sources of wisdom that I have in my life today. He is someone that I I look to for guidance consistently. Because I've come to this place where I've realized that God hasn't asked me to be Ben. He didn't invite Ben 2.0 to Breakaway. And the good news is that he's freed me up to celebrate what God is doing through Ben because a win through Ben for the kingdom is a win for me. And so I can just celebrate what God's doing in men's life. That's why I had Ben come back and preach at Breakaway. That's why when I went to the Passion Conference, I went to the DC location just so I could be where Ben was to cheer him on and celebrate him. Why? What what made the change? Well, the change came And the change continues to come as I realize that the cross of Jesus Christ does what comparison can't. Let me just, let me make sure you understand what I'm saying because if you want to turn the corner in comparison in your life, if you want to, if you want to reach a point where you can say enough with comparison, if you want to fight for your joy, then what you really have to do is you have to answer the question, why do you even compare? Why do you even compare yourself to other people? That's the question that you really need to answer, and I want to actually answer that question for you. Let me tell you why you compare yourself to others. A psychologist, Leon Festinger, 
he popularized in the 1950s something called the social comparison theory. Here's what he said, don't miss this. He said, we determine our social and personal worth based on how we stack up against others. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying the reason that we compare in our lives, the reason that we will compare ourselves to other people is because we are trying to determine how much we are worth in our society. We're trying to determine our value. So here's how things work. If you have the earth factor over other people, then you're more valuable than they are. But if someone has the earth factor over you, then they're more valuable than you are. If you have the as factor at play in your life, then you are at least as valuable as other people around you. Do you see how that works? We compare ourselves to others because we want to know the answer to the question, am I valuable? Here's the problem. The problem is that we live in a very fickle world that is constantly changing what it puts value on. So as value changes, in this world, that means that your value will constantly be changing in this world unless you look somewhere else to determine what you're actually worth. So if you wanna say enough with being enough, if you wanna say enough with comparison, then the best thing that you can do is look to the cross of Christ. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 puts it this way. It says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which what? Which lose their value. Implying that there is something else that doesn't lose its value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Do you hear what this is saying? What does God value most? God values his son, Jesus Christ, more than anything else in this world. And what did God do? He, it was his pleasure to crush his son to have you and me. So if you want to know how much you're worth, all you have to do is look at the cross of Jesus Christ because the son of God now determines your worth. You are valued at the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That is how much you're worth in this life. You are worth the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And it was God's will to crush his son as a declaration that he wants you. He wants you. That's your value today. Amen. You know what? You're going to go through life in different people. It's going to feel like they're going to hand you a letter that says something to the effect of, I regret to inform you, you are not enough for me. But you know what the good news is? The good news is that we have another letter that declares to us that we are enough for the God of the universe. So if the God of the universe is telling us this morning that we are enough for him, here's the question that you have to really answer. Is that enough for you? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you know that this talk is personal for me. And I believe it's personal for every person in this room. Every single one of us is acquainted with the feeling of not being enough for someone else. I just believe, Lord God, that it is not your desire for us to just hear this truth and walk out of this place and get back on the hamster wheel of trying to be enough. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons you came, Jesus, and you got up on that cross was through faith to declare that we are enough for you. Thank you for the value that you've placed on us. Thanks that we don't earn our value in this world. We receive our value 
in this world from you. You place value on us. We have been valued at the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Thanks for what you've done. God, it is our desire this morning to declare and to believe and to live out the reality enough with comparison, enough with being enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Timothy Atik, known to us as T.A., who is the Executive Director of Breakaway Ministries. Welcome, T.A. Thanks. So glad, glad to, be to here. have you back. Great yeah, to be back. it's great to have you back. Um, and you talked about a subject today that I think all of us struggle with, and that's comparison. Yeah. Um, I know that um, my, my women that I disciple and my discipleship groups I'm in, we talk about this so much. Yeah. Um, just like this pattern that you can get into of like looking at everyone else's life yeah. as you scroll by <laughs> and start thinking, uh, what is wrong with mine? Uh, and it is it's something that we are faced with all the time. And I love how you brought it back today. We talked about how David and Saul and just that mm-hmm. whole relationship piece. This is not a new struggle for yeah. us. Even though social media makes it yeah. maybe a little bit more prevalent. That's right. This is human nature in our flesh. Um, and so the question that came in today um, is asking about how do we fight this comparison thing daily? How do we, on a day-to-day basis, what does that look like to fight that? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think it goes back to what I talked about in the talk in terms of identifying the who, what, and when. It's like if you're going into battle, you know, you're, whoever your commanding officer is, is going to talk about those things. Who's the enemy? What, what are we aiming to? Where does the battle come into place mm-hmm. and how are we going to attack it? And so I think strategy in terms of dealing with comparison, it starts with identifying who you're prone to comparing yourself to, Mm -hmm. to even look in your life right now and just say, I know, I feel it on a regular basis that I'm drawn towards comparing myself to this specific person. Mm -hmm. And then what, what do you tend to compare? It's, it's really identifying what is, what you value, Mm -hmm. what you think needs to be highest priority in your life, whether it's your looks or your you know, job title or whatever it is, it's identifying those things um, can really help you be aware of when you're actually stepping into Mm -hmm. battle to say, well, I know I'm going to be around this person today. And so I need to start reminding myself of the truth before I get with that person and the evil one who's the father of all lies begins to whisper into Mm -hmm. my life. You have to remember that... um, the evil one is a liar. That's his main mode of operation. So, you know, if you don't spend time, you know, hearing from the Lord each day, then your mind by default is going to be exposed to more lies than truth. That's right. You have to spend time in the Word of God to know the truth about you. God's Word determines your reality. Okay, so... Spending time every day reminding yourself of what Christ has done to determine your worth allows you to step into those situations that you've already prepared for because you know, I tend to compare when I'm with this person and here's the things that I'm comparing and saying, you know what, you know what, I would like to weigh less or I'd like to to be more successful and whatnot, but in the end, Those are good things for me to make goals, to Mm -hmm. take steps towards, but my goal isn't to become this person. Mm -hmm. And and these things do not have any impact on my value. My value has already been cemented. Mm. And it can't change for the better or for the worse. My value is already maxed out. Mm. So it's to live in that. And that might sound real theoretical, but that's I'm trying to be as practical Mm -hmm. as possible. It is identifying where you're walking into battle. And then the way you arm yourself for battle is by reminding yourself of what God has already said about you. And so you you almost need to prepare yourself with, 
with words of truth right. that Absolutely. will counteract the lies. Mm -hmm. So that when you're in those situations and you hear that voice of saying, man, you're not nearly as high capacity, you're not as nearly as successful or not as nearly, you're not nearly as pretty as that person to say, God has determined my worth, period. Mm -hmm. He's determined my worth. Mm -hmm. What God celebrates is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. He doesn't celebrate physical beauty or high, being high capacity or being, you know, wealthy financially or immaterial. He celebrates faithfulness. I'm going to be faithful to steward the life he's given me, the body he's given me, the mind he's given me. And that is what you're called to do, to steward what God has given you, the weaknesses with what he's given you and the strengths, steward it well. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's so important to remind us that, our, that what you said about what God values, our faithfulness and our obedience. And yeah. um, I, the whole arm yourself of truth and just saying, and I can think about how many times I've had to say to myself, like audience of one, this is what God believes about me. This is what God said is true. Yeah. To like bring myself back away from when my mind starts wandering towards those places. And um, I even encourage people to speak it out loud, mm -hmm. to say, this is the lie I'm hearing right now, to call it out as a lie, to say, the lie I'm hearing is that I would be enough if I was more like this person. Mm -hmm. That is a lie because if God wanted me to be like them, He would have made, made me, me like person. them. He's made me this way. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That calling it out is there's power That's in that and sharing it with another person. Just to say, hey, here's the For thought that I had. Yeah. And to just expose that, mm -hmm. that, that power gets released the more that you expose the lies. Because the reality is you might not be able to speak the words mm -hmm. of truth to you because your mind is mm -hmm. so distorted. So you might need friends who can open up the word and say, this is what's true. That's so good. Okay, so you're back with us next week. Yep. We're really excited about that. Any preview on... Uh, What's coming? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll be talking about conformity and it will drive you insane to think about all of the ways that you distort who you are as a person to be who someone else thinks mm. you need to be in order for them to put their stamp of approval and say, you're enough for me. We change who we are. We mm. change our personalities around different people. We change our senses of humor. We change the way that we talk, the way that we act. We change what we like or don't like in the moment because we want mm -hmm. other people's approval so badly. That's conformity. And so we try and become who someone else needs us to be in order for them to say, you're enough. So we're going to deal with that. And the I'm hope is freedom to just walk and say like, no, this is how God has, God has made me. So. Awesome. Well, we're yeah. glad to have you back with us yeah, next week. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for being here, and thanks for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.